All right, well, once again, my name is Heather exner Pro. It's my privilege to be chairing this session. Uh, and I want to say this, this is the session on First Nations and Municipal Reconciliation. And this is a very important topic for people personally and professionally. Uh, when I was approached to chair the SURF conference this year, this was the reason, this was the incentive, this was the opportunity for me, I thought, was to host this discussion and have this discussion for SURF in Saskatchewan about the, really the journey that the rural Saskatchewan has been taking towards reconciliation. And I had the privilege, maybe some of you did too, to attend some of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's hearings. It happened about six or seven years ago. I attended the one in Saskatoon. And on that day, it was a very hard day, very emotional day, if anyone uh, had also gone, heard some hard stories. And the elders warned us that uh, the truth was hard, but also that, you know, the reconciliation would probably be even harder. And there would be a, a long journey, and there would be bumps in the road. And earlier this year in February, as many of you probably saw in the news, there was a big bump in the road Saskatchewan, uh, with the, the death of Colton Bushy and the trial of Gerald Stanley. And it made national and international news, and, and not in a bright light, I don't think, for Saskatchewan. It exposed a lot of the anger and the fear and the prejudice that still exists. And I think uh, um, it, it paints a certain picture of rural Saskatchewan, uh, which was very hard for me to hear and to see. And it was painful, uh, not only because it reminded me of how far we still have to go, but because I don't think it's the whole picture. I don't think people got to see the whole picture of what is happening in rural Saskatchewan. And I am very privileged that in my day-to-day -day work, working at the University of Saskatchewan, working with people like Charlotte, the Saskatchewan First Nations Economic Development Network, I really see the best of rural Saskatchewan. And I see the very best of First Nations and Métis and non-Indigenous people collaborating in every kind of way, in every kind of sense, as family, as friends, as work colleagues, um, and, 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 and really doing the hard work of reconciliation and collaboration and it's not new in Saskatchewan uh, people have been working together since you know since my family settled in the 1880s uh, depended on their on their neighbors and it's uh, and, and, and it continues so there was never a time where there wasn't collaboration between First Nations and non-Indigenous people and so it's not an abstract concept. I think sometimes at universities, reconciliation becomes very abstract. In rural Saskatchewan, it's not abstract. It's really, we're ground zero for reconciliation in this country, in rural Saskatchewan. And it's hard work, but um, Charlotte and our, our friend, he's the co-chair of uh, SFN Media, Milton Tatusis, he also works at the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. Once he said to me that, you know, the real standard, the real test of reconciliation is whether or not we're breaking bread together. And he asked, not just to me, but to a group, have you ever had an Indigenous person in your home? Have you ever hosted as a guest an Indigenous person in your home? And to the Indigenous people, have you ever hosted a white person in your home? And I don't think that happens very much uh, with my colleagues at the university. But... Uh, in rural Saskatchewan, and I'll share this personal story, I had a family member in rural Saskatchewan, family members um, that are, I will say, can be, can be racist. There's no doubt. They say things that sometimes I'm uncomfortable with, uh, even shocked by, surprised by. I can promise you there's no paternalism and no tokenism, but there is prejudice. Uh, and, and sometimes it's hard for me to hear some of the things they say. As Phil said, he put it very well before, that we have caricatures of people as ill-intentioned others, I think, on both sides. But when that same family member passed away, unfortunately, recently, uh, went to his funeral. And about a third of the people at his funeral were First Nations and Métis people. They were his friends. Many of them were, were literally his family through intermarriage and colleagues. And so I, and it made me realize how complicated it is. Uh, that it's not just a matter of, you know, if you're racist, that doesn't mean that you don't have the colleagues and the connections and the friends. Uh, it, it means that it's, it's complicated, it's not abstract. It's something people deal with in rural Saskatchewan every day. And so for me, putting together this panel, this was an opportunity for us to go to some of the nuance of what happens, uh, you know, in, in rural areas uh, with First Nations and Métis neighbors. And I am so very grateful. This, is, this can be a hard discussion to have. And I'm very glad that we're having it at SURF. This would be a hard discussion to have, and I'm so grateful to these panelists that they were willing to come here today and share their perspectives and lend that nuance uh, to reconciliation. 
and share not only what's hard about reconciliation, but about the many great things that we're doing before together in Saskatchewan, and to share that with you. So I'm very pleased, I'm going to go through the names and then they can um, kind of get up in sequence. I have uh, to my right, Neil Sasakamus is the Executive Director of the Battle Hearts Agency Tribal Chiefs. I have a big time with us. He's also president of many, many things. Uh, I'll mention a few BATC investments, First Alliance Group of Companies, Green Tech Retail, and a board member of the infamous, to some people the infamous, Fred Sakamoose Chief Understood National Hockey Championship. Uh, to his right is Ray Orr, the president of the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, also the chair of the Rural Forum of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and is currently the Reeve of QFAR. Uh, for a long standing. Welcome to Charlotte Ross, my close friend and colleague. She's the co chair of the Saskatchewan First Nations Economic Development Network, a member of the Montreal Lake Cree Nation, a resident of Rosetown, Saskatchewan, where she's a majority shareholder in a grain storage bin building business. So, welcome to Charlotte. And last but not least, Chad Nelson, a community engaged researcher at the Center for Forensic Behavioral Science at the University of Saskatchewan, and also researcher for the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance. And so we're going to start off with this. Researchers. We're going to start off with Neil on his presentation to give his perspective on this issue. Okay, welcome. I guess uh, my name is Neil Sasakus, and uh, someone told me when you make a speech, you're not supposed to say my name is Neil Sasakus because I think they're supposed to say they already know. It. So I'm a person that uh, they let me out today. I run a, a tribal council in a rural setting, um, it, uh, and I work for seven First Nation bands. I'm, I'm fortunate to work for seven First Nation bands. I am a uh, I'm a person that lives in a real world. So there's a theoretical world, and I don't have the luxury of the theoretical world. I live in a, in a real world. And in that real world, there's a bag of stuff. And I, my job is to figure out a path for each of those items. That's my job. It's to take something and build something, make something, leave something, create something, organize something, I'm building something. So I, I, like, I don't go to conferences much, I'm sorry. I don't get to speak much because a lot of the time it's theoretical for me. And it's a space I can't occupy in my mind because my mind's always in a development stage. It's always in a move forward stage. But I need to explain to you my version, I think, of what reconciliation, that I think that term is trying to say, and how it applies to a person like me. So if I could, we, I'm, I belong to this organization, we have a pilot project that we thought, okay, we are in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, and if there's a word, it's a conservative belt. Um, I'm not saying it in a negative way. And there's First Nations. It's North Battleford is surrounded by seven First Nations. And at any given time, there's 25% of that, that small city. Uh, every four people, there's going to be one First Nation person. So it's, it's about 25% of the population. We did a uh, pilot project. It's called SETI. Uh, Canadian Economic Development Initiative. It's funded through Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, and it's funded through the municipal, federal municipalities, federation of municipalities. So theoretically, the people in Ottawa thought it would be a great idea if we all get in a room, 25 white people, 25 Indian people, or 25 First Nation people. And so theoretically, let's get everyone in a room and let's break it down, okay. It was kind of like, well, okay, then let's go for it. So we get in the room, we go through these exercises, and we can't move past stage one. And stage one is about our relationship. Never mind economic development, labor strategies, uh, economic development plans, regional plans, industry development, resort development. All that is 
miles away. We get into a room and we, we want to know, I personally do, I want to know, what do I call you? I call you non-First Nation person. Like you call me a First Nation, but you don't know, I'm, I'm a Cree, I'm a Plains Cree. But let's get past that. I, but I'm really struggling, do I call you? Because do I call you a non-First Nation person? That's how I refer to you, that's how you refer to yourself. When you're in my presence, I want to call, I want to get past that. So we spend days and the, the 25 people, they take over and they say, we don't know what to call ourselves. Okay, so then, see, we start talking about stuff that's really difficult. Because for me, I'm a curious person, just like a lot of people are. I want to know how to refer, reference you. You have a culture, you have a language, you have land. And I want to know that, I want to understand you better. I think you have an idea of who I am, but I have an idea of who you are, but I, I want to understand. I really do. I really, really want to understand um, a white person. And I don't know if that's saying, saying that because I want you to understand a First Nation person. I want you to understand who I am. And I think that's, that's what we're all trying to get to somewhere. In rec it's eternally defined now. So that's, that's what we've been trying to do in North Battle. In the mix of that, there's a shooting, but it's been developing for years. Hate is both sides. I know a lot of non-First Nation people see, I'm trying to re make a reference, that there's hate. But there's also hate, hate on the First Nation side. And it, it, it just doesn't cross, it just goes. There's no boundary, it, it just doesn't know anything but that. So when we're doing this test pilot, and we're the ones in Canada that go through this, and uh, there's a shooting, it changes everything. We stop meeting. We don't want to see each other. You're over there, we're over here. Um, town's trying to get us on the agenda. Rural and RNs are trying to get us on the agenda. No, you guys go. And it's the same for us, but um, people are trying to invite them, you know, back and forth, and they say, no, we don't feel comfortable. So you go through these stages, then it just breaks down. But you got to find, I guess, the silver lining in, in anything. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I'm uh, trying to be as real as I can. But uh, I want to talk to you about, about some things here. Okay, so. so that's what we're here for. And it's really important to understand that picture. That's why we're here. And I can't drill that in to myself enough because that's a shameful picture to me. Not in a negative way, I'm ashamed of, I've been brought up to be ashamed of myself. You gotta understand that. And my friends, I grew up in, in rural Saskatchewan, went to school in small town my whole life since kindergarten. But they were ashamed too at the same time of poor me plus of themselves. So that's how we're raised. And we gotta cut the butter, we gotta get right at it. That, my chief, Attack a group and missed the losses. They're so significant to this area, Treaty 6, they call it. They created that picture. And what they wanted, the guy on the left, he wanted peace. That's what he wanted. He, he wants peace. He wants to come in here and he's tired of fighting and he wants peace and he wants settlement. And he wants growth and he wants future. And he wants to build a country. He wants progress. And, but he needs peace to have that. The guy on the right wants prosperity, I think, because they settle. They give everything up, and they want prosperity for their kids. I'm trying to find the right words. I'm just giving you my version. If there's a First Nation, 20 First Nations I'd be getting beaten up. Nah, that's not right. I'm just giving you my, my version of what I think. So that's what they wanted to achieve. And that's the premise, I think, of reconciliation, is that picture and those two words. Because my chief gave them peace in 18, a great man, and he wanted prosperity for his people. I will bite the bullet right now, but my kids' kids will have prosperity. They will be 
be better than where I am right now. So, my chief's timeline. It's important because I gotta speak from my own personal experience and I'm sorry. So Canada was born in 1867 and, and it's important to my reconciliation. It's, it's, it's important for your learning, but it's really more important for me because I have to, I have to go back and I have to pull these out of the closet. It's my healing. I, you know, whatever the right word is you want to use. There's a trust fund, and I have to personally settle with the trust fund. There's an Indian trust. Forty percent of all the resources pulled out of the Dominion of Canada that goes to England, forty percent is in a Indian money. It's an Indian trust, and sixty percent is given to the Crown to build all of this. So that, that's where that's the basis of why my anger is. I think I think my grandparents or my great-grandparents, and passed my dad, passed to me, and you see it. So it's important, it's important to understand that. Just I'm giving you my viewpoints again. My chief, two chiefs, Atakaku and Mr. Wallace, is two great leaders. If there's great leaders in the world, in my view, I'm biased, those two chiefs were great leaders because they chose peace in a time when there's resistance and anger and transition, all these pieces, they signed the Treaty 6 in Fort Carlton. And that Treaty 6 is 117,000 square miles. That goes from the eastern side of Saskatchewan to the uh, La Ronge area to the southern side of the Saskatchewan River, all the way to Jasper. That's the track of land that those two chiefs signed over to the Crown so that Canada could exist. And we get, I get, so that there's, that's a contract. I get every day, every year, May 15th ish, I line up for $5. The reason why I get $5 is because the treaty says you will pay me $5 for that track line. It says a lot of things, but the, the $5 payment is our agreement to be. When that $5 payment ceases to exist, there's, the arrangement is done. So that's why once a year, the RCMP, a representative of the General Government of Canada, um, and some officials come and give you a crisp $5 bill, shake my hand, and then you move the line. That's been going on since 1877. The Indian Act comes in, I don't want to get too far into this stuff. The Indian Act comes in in 1876 and it restricts what I can do now. It, 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 it's, it's a protective piece of legislation because you can't come on my reserve land. It creates me a reserve land, but you can't come on there without a pass. You can't, that's trespassing. A white person cannot come on that reserve. It's, but I can leave it. And it, it starts narrowing my scope of life really quick. And it's an important piece, it's a huge piece, but it's part of my healing a bit, or my, my road to recovery, because I, gotta, I have to reconcile with this stuff before I can even talk to you. In 1885, there's a Northwest Rebellion, and I'm, I'm only speaking from my view. In 1885, there's a Northwest Rebellion in the region. That rebellion hammered the First Nations people around that way. They took their bands, they, they took their people, they took their chiefs, and they're called rebellion bands. And bands were removed from the Indian Act, they were amalgamated, they were, people were dispersed. It was, a, it was a disaster. My chief said, they went to my chief and they said, we want you to come and fight. My chief goes back to his earlier statement, no, I touched a pipe and I made peace. He knew there was going to be turbulence, but he always stayed the course with Mr. Wasis that they would not fight. They would not be angry because that's how spiritual those people are. 1894, our school opens for my reserve. It's called St. Michael's Residential School. So 
just say about that. That's a piece my dad has been dealing with. And that's a piece I'm dealing with because of my relationship with my dad. So that's a piece. And you hear that and people will say, well, get over it. Well, you know what? It's so deep. It's not for you. It's, it's actually for me because I am trying to reconcile with my dad. And I can only speak narrow. There's people that can come in here and talk about that, but I can only speak from a one person view. The transfer of resources went to the provinces in 1930. That's a piece too that I have to reconcile with because it's preventing me from developing an economy. My $5 exchange for that resource prevents me from developing oil and gas, potash mines, um, any kind of resource development, any kind of resource development that actually directly affects me now today because I cannot build an economy in a rural setting. I can't build anything. Without that piece, I'm restricted. So you'll hear that, I'm reconciling with that because I don't want to be poor, I want to have wealth. That's directly affected. 1951, Indian registry comes in. That's a piece that affects me because it gives me a new name. It gives me uh, a 10 digit number. Um, it's a tree, it's an Indian registry number. It's a status card we get. I used to have, I think I was on an identity. I had a treaty payless number before that. And in about 51, they come up with an Indian registry now. And that is connected to the Indian Act, but that really restricts my freedom. I think my freedom in your box, it really does. This is where things really start getting deep for us. And this is our reconciliation. Alcohol and, and voting, but alcohol in 1960s allowed. And it's, we know the end of that. I think anyone in this room that's been around alcohol in those years and come from tough families, from farms and that, you understand what it does. It decimated a whole group of people. Alcohol and First Nations are, don't mix. Those years are really tough. I'm, I'm born in 1967 and I'm just reconciling with that still because my father is in that box. So some of the stuff I'm trying to attach to it and clean my own little soul. Voting. Voting's difficult for us. People ask me why don't people vote because they don't look as, as Canada as, you gotta, be, I'm trying to be careful because I'm just gonna first try to say, wait, what? We don't look as Canada as our government. We look at, Canada is only being as old as that, and that's your, that's your Canada. So when people, candidates come out to our area, and, yeah, let's get the vote, that's why people don't vote. It's, it's one of them, it's the main reason. We're taught, don't go vote. And then Indian Act elections come in in the vote of times. In, in around the 60s, we start voting for Indian Act chiefs, or it tells us we need to vote for a chief. Before that, we have a hereditary system where a chief is there and he's gotta be sober, He's got to be to live a clean life. There's a whole bunch of traditional things that come. In 1960, it changes. We start voting. And then with voting, it becomes campaigning and politics. That's what happens when you elect. Before that, we have a traditional system where the leader is there for life. Until people remove him or he can't serve us, then he's taken and moving. And, and they've trained people and develop them so that that chief is there. It's just a traditional system we've had. It changes in the 60s for us. Our first school opens in 1961. This is a kindergarten, K to three. But I'm reconciling with that because I'm taught not to go to that school. It's a poor school. It's run by the reserves. I can't go to school there. My dad won't send me there. He wants me to go to the white school. So I don't go to school there at all. It's later on in the years, but I don't go to school there because my dad wants me to go and mingle and learn white people and understand English really well. I don't even have my language. My mom is ever fluent in her language. I don't have my language because my dad was so focused on me 
mixing with you, which is a good thing. He, I can understand what he's trying to achieve. He wants a better life. So that opens, I am taught, my whole existence is it's a poor and inferior education system. Seriously, I'm, that's what I'm reconciling internally. But it, it moves on to my real development. This is another place. Welfare is introduced by the government of Canada or to a, by our trustee, we call them our agent or our trustee. In about 63, it's brought to us. Before that, we don't know anything about welfare. And it, it decimates my reserve and the people around us and every reserve. That word killed a whole generation. And I am dealing with that. It's not your problem, but I have to address that because that's in between me and my First Nation brother or sister, I have to address that because that is hurting my development with my rural partner. Because you are living close to reserve now and all you see is alcohol and welfare. That is the worst thing that happened to us in those years. One of the worst things because my grandparents and my father hate that. They hate welfare. They don't love it like it. They want it gone. They want it eradicated. They don't want it. But it's so ingrained in our system, it's a strategy now to get out. And I have to call the way it is. In 1980, we started administering money. Until then, we're managed by a town called Shelburne, um, Indian Northern Affairs. We start managing money for smaller projects like maybe on uh, waste management or digging wells or a small administration. We might have a reception and a band office open to us. So you hear the word band office? We start managing money only in 1980. And that's not very long ago because I'm a summer student a few years later now. In 82, the, the Constitution comes, and this is a big thing for me, because the Constitution comes, the Queen signs over here. She, but one of, her, one of her issues is that the Queen, I have to think because that's the well, only thing I know, the Crown or the Queen, she calls us her children. So when she comes over, we're her children. And I'm saying it from a good point. That's what, how she refers to her Indian people is our children or our First Nation people. Those are my children. We have a hard time there because my my father is in that space. He's cheap then and he doesn't know what to do. The, her mother just gave the country to people he doesn't trust and our five dollar payment is in that box and our agreement is in that box. Our our treaties in that box. So it becomes a big issue in 1982. And it's something we're digging out of now. In 1992, there's a, it's important because it connects to the 1876 treaty land entitlement when the, it's a place where bands, when they sign treaty, you're giving one section of land per family five. That's what the treaty is. You get one section of family for a family five if there's, if there's uh, 300 people on a reserve. My reserve was 67 square miles. It's six by 10. And that's where my Indian reserve is. At the time of 1876, we were 67.7 miles square. And the treaty land entitlement is there for bands that are either rebellion bands, that their lands were taken, that they had an, actually an arrangement, a $5 arrangement, no, 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 you have an arrangement. That's what it's settling, is 1876. And, and there's a whole theory on it, I'm just telling you a real quick understanding. Now, the future. I am here now, I have to figure out what I need to do. 
I have to figure out how I engage with you, how I move forward with you. I have to. I have to because the economy is there. My aspirations, my ambitions are all in that box. But this is my path that I'm trying to resolve personally. So there's my reconciliation, okay? I'm gonna finish up here right away. That's my dad on the left. His name's Fred Sasak. He's the first NHL Indian hockey player in, well, in the National Hockey League. I don't know how you say that, but, and, oops. And that's the governor general on the right. He got his medal, his Order of Canada, he last May, or in the spring of May here. And so I look at that picture. That's a man with lots of pain on the left, lots of pain. All those pieces in that puzzle I just showed you, that's what he carries. But no different than what you carry. Because I learned with Mennonites and Lutherans and talking with people and learning and trying to understand white people, you have lots of pain. That's not very old either. Talking to the Mennonite people and the Lutheran people and understanding them a little bit better. And I'm not a Christian, I think, I think I am. But I'm trying to understand people. I sit with old white people or Canadian people or non-First Nation. I don't know what the right word is. See, I'm lost when it comes to that word. But I, I like sitting with older people that are about 80 to 9 years old. And I like asking them about their life because we do that for in, uh, Indian people or First Nation people. And I love doing that with people that grew up in rural Saskatchewan because I want to understand their life. And I want to understand how they looked at me or my dad. And I want to understand how are you? Like, how are you today? What do you think? So that's represent that. My reconciliation is I want to just forgive. I want to just forgiveness. Forgiveness to that guy on the left. I want to forgive the school teacher in Canwood High School. I want to forgive the parent from drove me to hockey every day. I was rude to. I want to forgive. I just I just want to move on. I want to forgive. And I want to, the people that ordered our reserve and we stole gas from when I was a kid, I want to I want to move on to get away from that. The person that I was rude to that came on the reserve, the white person, and I made him feel so uncomfortable, I, that's what I, I want to forgive that. I want to just move on. Acceptance. I want to accept my brothers, because I have three brothers that are addicts, and they've been on methadone for probably 15, 20 years. And I want to forgive those guys because it's not their fault. And I don't want to, I don't want to carry that. I want to accept Canada as a multicultural company, a place. I want to accept white people for the view they have towards First Nation people, I want to accept it. those kind of things. I want to just move on to those good words. I don't want to carry that anymore. Because the guy on the left told me, you never discriminate. Never discriminate. Never, 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 never do. No matter what, never do. I want to get to a point where all Saskatchewan where there's an elimination of hate, both sides. Like I said before, hate is a word, it's a, it's a thought, it's an emotion. It's what you want to be, but it's pointed. It's there for a specific purpose. And if you power it, we don't have that in our languages. We've had to create those words because our language doesn't have those things. We've had to create them. So I want, that for myself. I want, I want to understand my Canadian friend. I want to understand the white person. I really do. I'm intrigued by it. I'm mystified by it. I want to know. I want to eliminate dependency in my world. I want economic power and I want freedom. I want that in my world. I want that through those. 
I want to have a better partnership or relationship with rural Saskatchewan. I want that, I think. I want a better place. I want you and me to be an advocate for rural development. My people need rural development. And I want to build a trust towards that. I want trust. I want to go through and, and build things that are based on trust. Finally, I want to move on. I just want to move on. I want all my rocks that I carry and all, all my baggage. I don't want it to apply to what I do. I'm a person that has authority and I've been given delegated powers to make decisions for a future by Indian chiefs. I want not to carry any of my baggage into that circle because I cannot make a plan forward if I am full of anger or if I'm full of untrust. That's where I'm coming from. So I don't want to take too much of your time, but I thought I'd give you the Neil's 101 on what I think and what I'm here for, I think, and, and who I am. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. My presentation will last about five minutes, but uh, my speech writer in Regina will be upset with me if I deviate too much from that speech, which <laughs> I'm actually going to do uh, this morning. But I just wanted to um, to uh, say a few things about SARM because I'm not sure if, if everyone realizes what SARM is, the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities. And we have 296 uh, rural municipalities in this province, and they're all voluntary members of SARM. It's something that we're very proud of. And uh, if you've heard in the news lately uh, that um, uh, certain people think that RMs should amalgamate, uh, we're not opposed to amalgamation, but we certainly uh, need to uh, uh, do a lot more networking uh, with the other municipalities. We need to uh, really be strategic about what we're doing in our province. Uh, we have a, a good relationship with urban municipalities. We do not, however, have a real good relationship with First Nation communities, which is something that we're actually uh, striving to improve. So I appreciated Neil's comments this morning uh, about the, that relationship. And so um, I just wanted to uh, go back a bit. Uh, Heather made a comment this morning uh, about the uh, Colton Bushy and the unfortunate Gerald Stanley incident. I don't know how many of you know this in this room. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to talk about it. In fact, I think we need to talk about it more. But at the time that it happened, uh, there were a lot of terrible things that uh, went around on the social media. And I believe in the social media, I believe it can be a good thing. It can also be a very bad thing if it's not pleased. And uh, you remember Premier Wall stepped in and said, people don't put stuff like that on, the, on Facebook. That's, that's just terrible. And uh, I actually comment as well. Uh, because one of the gentlemen that made a comment was from a rural municipality. He was actually an RM counselor, and he said terrible things about First Nations people. And I said to him, you know what? We're better than this. We don't need this kind of stuff. We want to make sure that our members are responsible and, and polite to all of our neighbors. And uh, his council actually made him resign council because of what he said. And so I think that uh, that changed the attitude a bit in rural Saskatchewan, but it's something uh, um, I'm going to talk about a little further about how I, I believe. And I, you know what? I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers, but I think we have done some good things within the SARM organization to improve working relationship with First Nation. So I just want to um, you know, we focus on policy, we focus on governance. We have a lot of RMs out there, a lot of small ones. The biggest one, the largest population. Uh, just outside of Saskatoon is around 8,000 people. We are in Farman Park, and I think the smallest is around 70. Yeah, I think it's in our offer in the Southwest. And uh, we also provide a lot of services to our members. Uh, we have four internal working committees. We have agriculture, environment, infrastructure and development, and municipal governance. governance. And uh, um, quite recently, we created a rural, indigenous, task force within our, within our SARM board, 
with all of our SAR board members. Uh, we have eight um, SAR board members, uh, actually nine, sorry. We actually have a, um, the Real, the Real the Circle Administrators Association as a spot on our uh, agenda as well. If I could put this in my head. I'm kind of going through this stuff and not following the script. I just, just wanted to uh, show uh, this, this is a recent meeting that uh, my council had with uh, the Moscow Fitan. Uh, they're actually a First Nations uh, uh, group just outside of Regina. Uh, but, uh, you know, half, about half an hour out of Regina. And uh, we've been trying to have a meeting with this. Sir. This is our neighbor to the, to the south on the other side of the, uh, uh, the other side of the river, of Kapal River. And uh, there has been a change. And I believe there are a lot, there have been a lot of ch changes within, uh, around the province, not only on our own councils, but on First Nation councils as well. And you see there, if, I can't pick them all out, but uh, they have a fairly young council. They have a young council. They're very ambitious. They have, a, they have good gender balance. <laughs> they have a lot of young ladies on their council. And they're really adamant about working with us and talking with us. And so we brought out uh, some of the SARM people as well. You can see there's a lady there that works in the infrastructure side of it, uh, you know, with the road program. And the young gentleman um, to the, uh, in the center actually asked a question about one of our road projects. We went there to consult with them because we want to tell them that we're, we're, we're repairing a road that actually goes through the uh, First Nations Reserve. And he asked about um, if there was a possibility that they could have First Nations people working on the crew. And I said, you know, actually, I think you can put that in a tender. You could say, if you want 15 or 25 percent of the workers to be First Nations. And he said, but we don't have training. We don't have the actual training to be able to do that. And I said, we offer training through SARM. We train greater operators. We train municipal officials. But we don't do any training for First Nations. And, uh, and maybe that's something we should look at. Maybe we should offer our courses that we host at SARM to be open to First Nation people as well, because there are lots of ambitious people there that uh, certainly can help us and we can work together. So we have. Um, We've kind of established those kind of relationships, and a lot of our members are better at this than we are. Uh, but there are some, unfortunately, that don't do that, and we're trying to encourage them to do that through this municipal governance committee and also the Indigenous task force. And Neil talked about the TLE agreements, and I guess we don't need to talk too much about that before, but uh, these agreements, you know, obviously, they've been, in, they've been in place for quite a while. Uh, they're working, and uh, it does give First Nations you know, the rights for, for land entitlement. Um, and the fund, actually, the fund, the way it works is that the funding comes from the federal government, and SARM administers the fund, and it's uh, audited, and I think it's actually audited by us, and audited again by the province to make sure that that fund is dispersed properly, so it does uh, compensate our ends. Uh, that, um, you know, uh, have that uh, land in within the boundaries. And so, I've just got one more uh, thing I actually want to talk about. Um, just going back to the First Nations group, uh, the Indigenous Task Force, is that we do meet with the Office of Treaty Commissioner, and uh, we have a relationship with the FSIM. Um, it's not. It's not very good. Uh, fortunately, we've had lots of uh, ups and downs in that organization. Um, I I spoke about that up here actually in Saskatoon this past summer when they celebrated the uh, TLE anniversary. Uh, is that uh, something we need to work on? And actually, the um, chief and the president of the FSA when the treaty was uh, the uh, treaty on entitlement agreement was formed uh, was rolling pro the chief, and he actually is my neighbor. And I think we have a good understanding uh, about that agreement, and I think about agreements that are going forward, and how we can actually how we can actually improve, improve that relationship. And so FCM, the Federation of Canadian, uh, Canadian Municipalities, which I'm a part of as well, has recognized that, and, and Neil has spoken about that uh, the indigenous component that's in there, and they've actually um, there's another one that's actually in the roster area, so it's not far from here. There are a group of municipalities. Both rural and urban, and I believe to First Nations uh, 
bands have gone together and um, they've uh, created a, uh, a regional landfill at disposal site. And uh, we're hoping that uh, that's, you know, to be used as a model uh, for its success. So I think it's a good move as well. So just getting back, um, I guess summing up, um, what we need to do, what we sought out to do is to, you know, is to build trust. And Neil mentioned that in this presentation, there needs to be trust. And uh, we, it's something that we have to focus on. I actually invited Neil to come to our midterm convention here. It's coming uh, up in November. Uh, that's our uh, second convention we have here every year. So that he can sit in on some of the, on some of the workshops and maybe get a better understanding of what we're trying to do as well. Uh, focusing, we're definitely focusing on economic development, uh, working partnerships. We do have some already. We have quite a few working relationships, uh, some formal, some not formal. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do, uh, we've been trying this for a few years, and I spoke about this before in Saskatoon. Uh, we're trying to create an emergency response fund. And if you remember going back, it's about two or three years, it was a, there was a First Nations uh, uh, band, unfortunately, where there were two young uh, First Nations girls that died in a house fire. And because of the fact that the, uh, the fire department didn't have an agreement with the RM, I stated publicly here, and I can say it again, that we hope that never happens again. We need to make sure that um, our First Nations neighbors are protected as well. And so we've asked the federal government and the province as well uh, to help create an emergency response fund so that there's money there in case of an emergency. The, uh, the fire departments have to be able to go. They have to you know, get paid for their, for their work, but they also have to have liability insurance to protect the firefighters themselves. And so uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, we don't seem to be gaining on that. I was at the point where I, I, we'd say to the federal government, we've asked for this for about four years in a row. And they keep saying, uh, we understand, but we still don't see anything. And, uh, we're going back again this year. In fact, we just got back from Ottawa uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we asked them again to help uh, create that fund. So I think, uh, in, just in closing, I'm sure we'll cover more often questions. So th thank you very much for your time this morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see everyone here today. Thanks so much for, uh, for the invite. and. Uh, Really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to be involved in this panel. I think that we've heard some, uh, to me, some very important uh, uh, language, uh, some important commitments that uh, that I see from uh, from some leaders in our rural areas that I uh, I know that I'll take with me. And uh, I wanted to uh, introduce myself, uh, kind of wearing three hats today. So. Uh, today, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to speak on, on different perspectives uh, of this panel. Uh, one from the view of a political scientist, um, and so I'll try to focus a little bit on, on rural governance and, and relationships between the gover government levels. Uh, I also will talk and speak from, from my perspective as a criminal justician, where uh, my job is to evaluate, uh, uh, to research uh, the impact of, of community safety initiatives, the impact of crime prevention initiatives, and, uh, and then the third hat, or the third kind of voice that I'll speak from today is that of a, a community advisor, that uh, of, a, of a support uh, to many, uh, many uh, Indigenous, both Métis and First Nation governments uh, uh, located across Canada. And so the work that I've done over the last decade is, has really given me a, a strong and diverse sense of, of many of the different political and, and cultural and economic and just people-based uh, challenges and opportunities that, that are here before us. Um, I just want to just share a, a little bit about my own uh, journey with reconciliation. And uh, it started about 10 years ago. And uh, uh, my wife had, had taken me to uh, her nation's powwow. Uh, that was my first, first uh, exposure to, to that uh, ceremony, to that, uh, uh, that celebration. And I remember sitting there, uh, enjoying the best uh, bison uh, and uh, Bannockburger of all time. Uh, and I, the MC, who was an elder, uh, spoke, risen to spoke, uh, speak. And uh, he welcomed everyone, welcomed the, the leaders, welcomed the elders, the grandmothers, and the grandfathers. And, and then he had also welcomed uh, a European visitor. I remember leaning over to my wife, holy shit, 
somebody came in from Europe to watch this. This is crazy. And when I looked up, everyone was looking at me. And I thought, hmm. So it made me think. It made me think about, well, I mean, okay, I guess, you know, it was trying to be funny. And, and but then I thought, well, maybe, you know, how, I have, how am I a visitor? Well, for the last 10 years, I have spent a lot of time, I'd say 60 to 70% of my time, I'm a visitor to different nations, located right here in Saskatchewan. And through that journey, I've learned uh, a lot about myself, a lot about other communities, a lot about other nations and their histories, and the diverse histories that, uh, that go across this landscape. And uh, I would really say that you know, learning about uh, First Nations or Métis or Inuit people, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's a life journey. There is so much diversity just within our First Nations here in Saskatchewan, within our Métis nations, uh, that it's going to take many lifetimes to achieve that. But one thing that I think we can recognize and that we should celebrate, and, uh, and, and I, I, I really believe Neil said this well, uh, was that you know, where does our journey start? And so the next step of my journey, back to my personal story, I was about three weeks ago, and Muscadet First Nation, the grandfathers had asked me to, uh, uh, to be a sacred firekeeper at their ceremony, and I was pretty fired up about that. And, and uh, when I got there, and I started to do, do the work that I was asked to do by the elders, one of the elders who had hosted a uh, pipe ceremony asked me to be part of that pipe ceremony. And this was the exact elder 10 years ago who had uh, said, welcome European visitor. And so he knew who I was, and he uh, invited me to that pipe ceremony. And so it was a, a, a lifting moment for me. And uh, I think to me what it taught me was that yeah, sure, I've been working with First Nation communities for a decade, but just still starting to learn. And if we have that attitude, if we have that, that trust in ourselves and trust in our friends uh, across the, the different nations, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, to do some good work with recon reconciliation and move towards the shared prosperity that was the original vision uh, at treaty and even before a treaty. So, so why I'm here to speak today uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the opportunities of reconciliation, the opportunities of world revitalization. And I think there are many opportunities uh, before us uh, that First Nation and Métis and rural or municipal governments can, can achieve together through collaboration. And that collaboration is, is something that's going to take some work. It's going to take work not just from the personal perspectives that that you've heard today, but it's going to take some work recognizing that we do have some institutional and structural roadblocks that are inherent to our political system, one that we've created, one that was inherited by force to our First Nation brothers and sisters. And so I think that, that recognizing some of those shortfalls will help us collaborate. So let me speak to a few examples here. So with respect to in, in, in rural regions, and I speak when I speak rural, I mean both in south and northern Saskatchewan, I speak to the fact that we have municipalities and we have Indigenous government, uh, uh, established, governments established to serve people, to protect people, to build prosperity. And so some of the challenges in, in those different organizations, uh, being able to collaborate, stem from their own design. So for example, the short governance terms uh, and this is a real barrier. When you have council at the municipal level and you have council uh, in, in, in First Nation communities that, that are elected uh, every three years, that's a, that's a challenge. And when you have uh, communities, like the example we just heard of, trying to collaborate and, <clears throat> and complete restoration of a 200-year-old mistake in a three-year election cycle, it's difficult. And by the way, don't forget that the three-year election cycle of the Grievance Council does not always overlap with the three-year election cycle of Chief and Council. So you may only have uh, elected officials serve time together a year and a half before one of them or all of them are, are, are either replaced or perhaps focused on, on re-election. I think the other thing that we need to recognize is that there are different roles and perceptions of our municipal leaders as well as our, our indigenous leaders. So to give you a, an example, a, 
And, and, and I don't mean to simplify any of this, by the way, but I just want to highlight some, some clear differences. An RM Reeve and a counselor uh, receive phone calls, receive petitions, receive letters, receive presentations about issues in the community, whether it's regarding infrastructure or education or perhaps a, a crime. And, and so there are complaints. And so in the process of trying to, to uh, um, address those complaints, uh, Reeves and, and counselors will often move to other levels of government, namely the province or, or the federal government, uh, to say, hey, we've we got some issues here we need some help with. First Nation counselors, on the other hand, literally are pulled in to some of these various situations. Whereas, yes, the First Nations chief and council may receive a letter, uh, may receive a, a, a visit from a band member saying, hey, you know what, we've got to do something here. Not only are they made aware of these things, Formally, but there are counselors who are approached by nation members to literally help with with issues And so many of the counselors that, that I've had the chance to learn from and, and work with in a single day They will find themselves in a situation where they are trying to find housing for a victim of abuse and her, her children While also the same day trying to find a treatment bed for the abusive uh, partner husband and break right between that and trying to uh, plan a, uh, a uh, ceremony will jump into a band meeting regarding treaty land entitlement or regarding big decisions regarding land or business enterprise. And so I think there are great similarities between our leaders in our nations and our municipalities, but I also think we need to recognize that the role of an elected councillor in a First Nation is very different than an elected councillor in, in a municipality. The, mark, the reason for that is because if you look at the proximity, nations are set up with, and not all of them, but many of them are set up with, or with schools and health centers and resources to support other nation members. And the counselors at these tables have portfolios supporting those. So just like our federal minister or provincial minister uh, would receive um, requests or, or complaints uh, uh, an issue, so do uh, the, the portfolio counselors. Because of the proximity, if you look at a community of 50 or 300 or 500, those counselors are literally problem solvers, day and night, 24 seven. So that journey is a little bit different. And so I think the role of, of uh, addressing criminality, the role of addressing diabetes or, or addressing uh, uh, school turnover, is a lot different coming from the municipal, whether it's urban or rural, and, a, and an Indigenous perspective, Métis or, or First Nation government. There's also different paths of accountability. And so looking at uh, municipal leaders, municipal leaders are largely accountable, uh, and I don't mean to downplay this, but we're talking about taxpayer expectations uh, of economic efficiency um, and, and, the, and the return cycle that happens every, every three years. And there's an annual uh, a budget and there's a there's an overview of the audit that comes to, to, to rate payers and that's the accountability when you look, look at indigenous leaders they are both accountable to their nation members for delivering outcomes and services and meeting uh, band member needs but there are there is also that relationship with uh, reporting to indigenous services canada and there's that 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 reality um fostered by by um, perpetuation of the indian act that manages fund transfers. So it is, again, a different path of accountability between our municipal and our, and our uh, First Nation leaders. I also want to speak to the fact that we have to recognize different resource capacities. In our rural municipalities, for the most part, there are skeleton staff. And there may be an administrator or a, or a, a clerk, there are, there are radio operators, perhaps a few public works staff. And so largely the relationship between the constituents or the electorate and the rural municipality government is pretty basic. Hey councillor, I got some big potholes on my road. I'd like you to come fix them. Or what are we going to do about that zone for that new agricultural building? The difference, of course, in capacity in, among First Nation governments is the management, the, um, the uh, development, and, and the ownership of schools, and health centers, and, and, so, and, uh, and public works, and the environment, and child and family services, and bylaw, and lands, and, and daycare, and, and 
stores and, and economic enterprise. That's a lot of a lot of things that that, that builds uh, um, capacity for the, the nation members. But it also is uh, to me it creates a little bit of a difference in the experience of the of the elected. And so collaboration, uh, collaborative opportunities need to need to take note of that. Because if we have rural municipalities and First Nations in the same region sitting down trying to tackle crime problems, trying to tackle health problems, there's going to be a different, a different level of conversation where some of the nation leaders uh, can, can, can pursue some of these outcomes at a much greater, to a much greater extent than, our, than some of our rural municipalities. And the final thing that has been touched on today and, and, and needs to continue to be touched on is our historic differences. The experience of rural municipalities through through time, uh, you know, including their interaction with their constituents as well as their interaction with one another, is remarkably different than the interaction of indigenous governments with their people, and and with Canada and with the dark history of the Indian agent. And so maybe 150 years seems long compared to some people, but it's not long for government. It's not long when you think about how long it takes to change institutions. So I've laid out some challenges and some hurdles, and I, I don't want to end with that. What I want to end with is, is one of many solutions we should consider looking at. The solution that I, I think is, is most worth the pursuit here, and, and I think it is tangible right now, whether it's One Arrow First Nation and Canistino, or whether it's Muscadine Church Hills, or whether it's Patchenac and English River, this is a pursuit that is tangible and doable tomorrow or today after lunch. The fact of the matter is our elected leaders in both municipal and First Nation governments need to start defining their relationships, not in terms of jurisdictional asymmetries or symmetries, but in terms of shared outcomes. And so conventionally, if you look at our First Nation and Métis communities, we look at a nation-to-nation -nation negotiation relationship where, where whether it's talking about health or safety or, or well-being, the role of transfers between Canada and the various nations is kind of the focus, especially when it comes to on-reserve uh, Indigenous people. When we look at our municipalities, urban or rural to be honest, and through the design of confederation, we see our provinces largely supporting our municipalities in the areas of, of, of health and safety and well-being. I mean, maybe once in a while we'll get a little bonus or infrastructure from the feds, but largely that's our, that's our, our eyes, where our eyes are at. And so if we have Indigenous governments and municipal governments existing side by side in a literally sometimes 50 kilometer square area, or heck, they touch each other, they're separated by a road or a slew. If we have that proximity geographically, yet they're both focused on the interaction with other, other levels of government, okay? We're missing the reality that those communities share the areas and uh, of reality around economics, around crime, around health, education, whatever you want, whatever you want, example you want to come up with. So I believe that our municipal levels of government, our indigenous governments need to sit side by side, not across the room from each other, side by side, and look at the preferred outcomes of their constituents. What do band members want for their people? What prosperity do they want for the next generation of their nation members? Municipal government, what do your constituents, your rate payers, your voters, whatever you want to call them, what do they want and deserve? And if you looked at it, you would have to me a very a tremendous overlap, overlap, if not a replication. And so instead of us continuing to chase our, our confederation, uh, approach of we always got to go to the province or the feds to ask for something. Why don't we work together to pursue opportunities of shared outcomes and define our outcomes in the same way? Because if we define our outcomes in the same way, we're going to be able to pursue solutions together. And that, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is where we can get to what I refer to as the art of the possible. So if I stop there, you will think, oh, this, this is a Great theoretical speech. Yeah, this, this PhD from U of S got up and said some grand things. I'll give you a sense of reality. My reality as a community engaged scholar is out there. My reality is what I want to share with you in some actual examples of to me what is the art of the possible. 
when municipal and First Nation governments collaborate. English River Intervention and Support Circle, up in great, great adjacent to Pachanan, which is a northern village. Together, suffering from elevation and suicide, elevation in levels of violence, elevation in drug and alcohol use, and of course, what happens with all that, we have crime. Working in a crisis mode was something that, that the elders, chief and council, and the, the members of, of English River First Nation and the village of Patchnack didn't want to do it. And so in the last two years, representatives and, and community members from the nation and Patchnack, which basically are separated by nothing more than a piece of grass or fence or dirt, I mean, they're touching, was, hey, let's do something different for our community where we all want to work together. So we genuinely have uh, the development of the English River Intervention and Support Circle, which takes provincial human service providers and on reserve jurisdictionally, uh, First Nation Health Center and police and housing and addictions and navigators and every human service partner that is in that region works together upstream to try and reduce elevations and risk before she hits the fan. Chasing crises as they've been doing for 30 years wasn't getting the, these, this community, this joint community to where they wanted to be. And so uh, learning from the lessons of uh, Hub Model and Prince Albert, wraparound, healing circles, intervention that, is, that has been pioneered in Manitoba through Jordan's Principle and Alberta uh, through the uh, Muscogee's uh, intervention circle is a journey that Pachinac, the Northern Village and English River First Nation took together. Ladies and gentlemen, that is just one of at least eight different examples in the crime and human service sector that we can all learn from, and there are many more. But all we have to do is pursue shared outcomes. Thank you very much. I think I'm the shortest of all the all the presenters here this morning. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for asking myself through your co-chair uh, to come and share some, some little pieces of, uh, of wisdom, of knowledge, of experience. I want to thank my co-panel presenters, you know, starting with Neil. I just absolutely love the history. Um, I could sit and listen to history forever, but I know we have to get on with the conference and our, our panel. And I learned a lot from, from Sarp, from Ray, and also from Chad. And so every day is an opportunity to learn. Every day is an opportunity to build something different. And so the background to, to my life, yes, I was, I was born in La Ronge, actually. And I eventually became a member of Montreal Lake Cree Nation. But my first legal identity was as a Métis non-status person growing up off the reserve and not knowing why we were living off the reserve and all of our other relatives lived on the reserve. And as Chad said, he actually has some contact and, and does a lot of winter camping on that side of the lake between Montreal Lake, the band, and Malanosa where I grew up. And so, you know, just the, the whole history and, and I shared with Chad, that's part of our, our colonized history is we only know so much. And so going back to, you know, when I went to university and I wanted to, to go into some kind of study, I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew I had a passion for learning and I wanted to do, to do something with my life. Um, and eventually I ended up in Native Studies or Indigenous Studies as a degree and, and did a lot of classes, worked with a lot of elders and found out I knew, I knew only a little bit you know, so in the Cree language, I was born into the woodland Cree, so we speak the TH dialect, but I also was raised and grew up and worked and taught in the Plains Cree dialect, so I can speak the TH because that's what I was born into, but I also speak the Y dialect um, because that's those are the areas that I live in. I also understand the N dialect, which is a swampy Cree in Saskatchewan. And so when I went back to to figure out, you know, all the questions 
of asking. And I, that would have been reconciliation before reconciliation was even a word. And, and I was doing my university classes and, and trying to figure out and asking my dad, you know, did we ever dance? You know, did we ever have ceremonies? Did we ever have anything, anything like this? Lots. So the answer is no, no, we never had that. We never did that. And so I didn't say anything. I didn't, um, I was raised to respect my elders. And so I took his word for, for what he, for the truth. And, but I looked at the books and the books were telling me something totally different. And the books were saying, oh, no, you had this history, you had these practices, you had these beliefs, but he was not, he was not ready to share with me. And so I finished my degree, fast forward, worked at NORTEP off campus, a teacher education program in Orange, taught Cree in Indigenous studies, EPS classes, worked with students who were going into education, as well as other professional colleges. And so one trip, I stopped at the trap line, which I'm now, along with my niece, responsible for carrying on that part of our family tradition, our trap line, the commercial fishing. So I stopped at the trap line and I could smell sweet grass. And so sweet grass was what we had learned about, you know, being in university. And so I asked my dad, I said, you know what, dad, in Cree, I said, I can smell sweet grass. I said, I know you keep saying no, and I know you say you know, we never had this, but am I going crazy? Because now I'm like imagining it in my head. He said, oh no. He said, look at that my boutique. He said, oh no, it's hanging up there right above your head. And so I was like, what? What do you mean it's hanging above my head? Oh yeah, he said, um, I right above your head. And so I said, do you know what that's for? I said, um, how did you get it? Like, uh, this is what I've been asking about all these questions. Oh yeah, he said, he said, I know what you're asking about. He said, I know what you're talking about. He said, I knew what it was long before you ever asked me any questions in Cree. And so I said, okay. I said, can you tell me, can you tell me how you know about this? He said, well, I really shouldn't tell you. He said, because you might get arrested. He said, you might be arrested. So here's the phone number, you know, he took a pen and he didn't have literacy, but he could write some very basic numbers. He had numeracy. So he wrote down the phone number, wrote down the name. And he said, here's the number to the lawyer that um, is a friend of mine in PA and he'll come and bail you out of jail and I'll come and get you. And so, and this isn't a hundred years ago that this was, that this happened. Um, my son is 28, my oldest son is 28, so this was about 25 years ago. And so I sat with my dad and listened to a story and listened to the story of being enfranchised, of being uh, kicked off the reserve and being forced to leave the reserve because his mother practiced ceremonies. And so when Neil talks about the Indian Act and what pieces of the Indian Act are enforceable, the belief system, the practice of your culture, the practice of ceremonies was strictly prohibited within the Indian Act. And so in our family history, and in a lot of communities, especially the northern part of the province, that's still hidden and it's still really dangerous to talk about it. And so the fact that, that it was there was totally unknown, unknown to, to us. My grandmother was told that she was in French, that not, she was taken off the band list. She was kicked off the band list, but she couldn't read. And so the paper that was presented to her was, it could have been a shopping list. It could have been anything else. And so that was, those are some of the legacies and some of the histories that we have to reconcile with in terms of our family and my family. So fast forward into, um, you know, the time when I finished my degree and, and got all my, my ducks in a row, and I wanted to go home. So I went home to La Ronge, because La Ronge was the nearest place that, um, that had like a bank, and you had like a post office, and you, know, you had some restaurants, and you had a hotel. And so La Ronge was where I, I went to. And I thought, you know, I don't know where I'm gonna go or what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna leave it up to the creator. And that's really my whole philosophy, is leaving my life and my, my activity up to um, so the, the creator, the, the father of, of all of us, the creator of life, to sort of say, here are the skills I have. Um, so I went and worked at the university for off campus with NORTAP program. And then I came on campus and worked on campus for about 18 years and 
got to meet a lot of people, um, was a wonderful part of, of my growing and, and also a painful part of my growing because I had to reconcile what am I going to do after I leave the university. And so I left the university, a painful uh, process to, to leave somewhere that, that all of your time, your work life, your career has been invested in, in one organization. And so I loved where I was, um, but I also needed to leave and I needed to grow and I needed to do some different things. So I started doing consulting contract work and my involvement with the network started probably two years after I left the university with Saskatchewan First Nations Economic Development Network. And during that process, you know, I became my own business owner. Um, my partner and I are, are in a family business. This, and we do build rain storage bins uh, across the prairie provinces. And so we do reconciliation seasonally. It's a seasonal work. Um, and so we're talking to farmers all the time and we're in the rural communities. My son is 14. Uh, Stephen is my youngest son. He's taller than I am. Um, and, and he is working with his dad as well. And so they're out working in the communities. And Stephen's hair is really, really long. He's a dancer. He's a grass dancer. And so... You know, his best friends in the town we live in, we live in Rosetown, it's about an hour west of Saskatoon. Um, his best friends are non-First Nation in that town. He has also other best friends in other towns and his cousins. And so his whole world includes all four colors. You know, his, when he was in elementary school or he was in kindergarten, one of his very good friends was a little Chinese boy named Jerry. And so he and Jerry hung around and, you know, Stephen, his first daycare, he went to Chinese daycare. And so he was learning, he was learning different cultures and different languages um, just when he was a baby as well. And so when I think about, you know, reconciliation and what does it mean living in a rural area, um, I had the benefit of being a tour guide, a tour operator on Tuesday. And so I don't know if my, if my tour partners are in the room but we had a ball um i want to say you know we got the benefit and i was driving into saskatoon i do work with otc the office of the treaty commissioner teaching treaties in the classroom i've taught classes on the indian act um we do a lot of work on residential schools with sit uh some stuff with first nations family community institute working with child family services and doing training and so i was able to call Mary, she's the new uh, treaty commissioner, Mary Culbertson. So I was able to call her office and say, um, hey Mary, you know, we're coming to town, I'm doing this tour. Can we stop in and say hi? Because I was taking uh, participants over to English River anyway. And so her office assistant said, sure, stop in, Mary will make time for you. And she made a lot of time for us. And she spoke about the initiatives that the office of the treaty commissioner is undertaking that reaches out into rural communities. And last night, you know, we had the benefit of listening to an author, um, a speaker, a former police officer in Saskatoon, Ernie Ludet. And so he was talking about uh, his, his first book called Indian Ernie and about his experiences in Saskatoon. And the message is that, you know, he kept, he kept bringing back to the audience. And it was a packed, a packed hall in a rural town, in, in Rosetown, it was the Elks Hall. And so... You know, he said, words are powerful. You know, words can change uh, how people think and how people perceive. So it really, you know, he, he shared examples of how that happened in his own life and just the business building. And so I always am always, always um, a positive person and I always look at the glass as being half full. I look at the fact that we actually have a glass, never mind the glass being half full. It's like we never used to have a glass before. And so, you know, I'm always looking at all the positive things, but I also wanted to say, oh, we've got two minutes left. Um, when we go back to the history, I really liked Neil's, pro, Neil's slideshow and, you know, all the different points, but starting off with actually going back further to the Hudson's Bay Company, because I'm a his, history, I absolutely love history, Indigenous History Canada. When we go back to the Hudson's Bay Company to 1670, and how was the Hudson's Bay Company created? You know, how was that monopoly, that charter monopoly? It was based on trade, based on commerce. How was that created first? And then how was alcohol introduced in, in that time period and in that era and in what way? And then how did Britain, uh, how, how was the sale, to, uh, sale of Rupert's land to 
Canada to four provinces, Upper and Lower Canada, Nova Scotia, PEI. How did that occur? How did this happen? So the, actually the first, um, the first transaction in Canada was a loan, a loan from Britain. So Britain agreed to loan to Canada 300,000 pounds to purchase Rupert's land. So we go back to looking, you know, here's the history of what we know in terms of uh, creating Canada, but we actually go back 200 years prior to that. So it's really important when we're building relationships to just always know what our history is. And so what is our history? You know, where, they, where are we located? Rurally, where are we located? Who's located next to us? Who's our neighbor? So with that, I just want to say thank you for having, having us come up and, um, and share some bits of our lives with you and some bits of wisdom. Good night.